Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the web lecture series organized by the Department of English in collaboration with IQAC, Internal Quality Assurance Cell of our college. It's a great honor and privilege that today we have with us a renowned speaker, Professor Dr. Jaydeep Sharungi, principal, principal, New Alipur College. And other than these, he has another identity. He is a great poet. He is a well-known face in the field of writing poetry in recent times. He has written. He has received many national and international awards also. So uh, it's a great opportunity to all of us, partic particularly uh, to our students, that uh, they have uh, got the opportunity to listen to you, sir. So on behalf of our yes. students, on behalf of our department, on behalf of our college, I welcome you, sir, to the web lecture series. Thank you. And before his talk, I would like to request Dr. Bashar Dutta Ghosh, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Ulibiria College, to introduce our esteemed speaker for today's session. Thank you, sir. A very good morning to one and all. Uh, it's it's a really a privilege for us to have you, sir, amongst us. Uh, Professor Dr. Joydeep Sarangi is a widely anthologized bilingual poet with eight collections in English, latest being Heart Raining the Light, which was released in Rome in 2020. Professor Sarangi has read his poems in different shores of the globe. His latest readings and talks on poetry were at Flinders University, University of Western Australia, University of South Australia, University of Wollongong, Perth Poetry Club Australia, University of Udine, Italy, and University of Zizou, Poland. Professor Sarangi is one of the editorial uh, is on the editorial boards of different journals featuring poetry and articles on poetry, like Mascara Literary Review, Translation Literature Australia. Say to USA, Gitanjali and Beyond Scotland, Testa, WEC India. He has seven critical books on poetry and edited special issues on poetry for reputed journals in India and abroad. Uh, with Dr. Amelia Walker, he is guest editing a special volume for Text Australia. Among his recent awards, uh, the Setu Award of Excellence for 2019 USA and Sufi Award for Indian English Literature 2020. Apart from being an international poet, he is a professor of English and principal at New Alipur College, Kolkata. It is a, a great honor for us uh, to have you, sir, with us. Uh, the platform is all yours, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm also honored and I'm very happy and send you good voices from the other side of the river Ganges. I'm so happy to be attached to Tulbadiya College. I have seen its dynamism and uh, I'm really happy and all my good wishes for the college and that for the department in future as well. Now, without much delay, I directly come to uh, what I have something very much close to my heart about Indian English poetry, but due to the shortage of time, I will only concentrate on Kamala Das. I'll talk around 35 to 40 minutes and leave you open for, I think, three or four questions I can take later on. Anything you can ask so that we can take on to further directions. Now, why is Kamala Das so important? Who was born uh, in the year 1934? And part of his childhood was spent in her ancestral abode in Malabar, Kerala. And remember, other part of his uh, early part of his career was in Calcutta, where her father was posted for work. And Kamala Das's family in Kerala was considered as literary royal family in Kerala because his in his ancestors were also writers. Now Kamala Das came to literary scene in 1960s and remember 1950s is the time when 
Indian poetry in English became an independent, iconic body. And before that, prior to 1950, Indian English poetry was considered to be imitative by nature and which followed the proto-romantics and the romantics of the West. According to Keki Darwala and, and Nisim Azakiel and everybody, 1950 onwards, Indian English poetry became Indian English poetry, identical, unique, and it had its own components into that. Now, what happened in 1950 to begin with? We may argue with Jawaharlal Nehru's political philosophy, but one thing we'll have to accept, his vision about literary standards of India. Therefore, he was the person who could establish Shahitya Academy, Central Shahitya Academy in 1950s, mid-1950s. And uh, after the establishment of the Shahitya Academy in Delhi, it promoted Indian vernacular literatures as well as literatures in English in India enormously. It almost nurtured like anything. And what is Indian writing in English in these days? One, one of the byproducts of the establishment of Shahitya Academy and also the rise of the interest of the vernacular literatures uh, through vernacular languages in, uh, in India. Another important thing in 19, uh, early 1950s, we know a time to change the most important dynamic book which came into being by Nisim Ezekiel. And it changed the literary perspectives in India. And Nisim Ezekiel became the father of Indian poetry in English. And he started publishing a journal called the Quest in 1954, and he also started contributing into the, uh, the Illustrative Weekly of India. So 1952, 53, 54, these are the hunty hunty papa stage of Indian English poetry, which be which became a full grown tree uh, uh, in the years to come. Now, my very important assessment at this point of time in this morning that the enormous contribution that Nassim Ezekiel gave, his journal was the quest and illustrative weekly of India, where he used to publish the budding writers, budding poets of India. And uh, in 60s, we'll come to know how Kamala Das and others uh, started publishing in the, in the quest. And the quest is like Desh Putrika in Bengal. If you don't publish in Desh, the Bengali Academia will never consider you as a good poet. Similarly, if you don't publish your poems in the quest, you are not a good poet in Indian standard. Another very important thing in 1950s, very quickly, the establishment of P. Lal's Writer's Workshop. We have now, by the time of 1950, early part of 1950s, we have the poets, we have the journals, now, what we need, we need a good publisher who will come forward and publish the first maiden volumes of poems for the authors. And remember, in pub uh, publishing the first volume, maybe at times a commercial suicide. But P. Lal came forward and publishing the almost all great authors as well as the novels, novelists of Indian English writers. That's why the contribution of Writer's Workshop and Pilal made a watertight compartment between what was there and what is to coming up in the days to come. 1950s, late 1950s and early 60s, Indian professors started getting fellowships and invitations to uh, uh, universities abroad. And when they visited, like C.D. Narasimha, Alu Jankiram, and many others who started visiting Indian, uh, the foreign universities and tried to promote Indian writings in vernaculars as well as in English. 1960 saw the rise of a new brand of fresh poets who will be uh, very much visible in 1970s. 1970s saw the rise of Jayant Mahapatra, Keki Darwala, uh, uh, you know, we are celebrating 
50 years of KK Darwar's under the Orion and uh, and uh, half a century old and still writing KK Darwala Janta Mahapatra 1971 and also the rise of female voices and Kamala Das is not an exception. Now, with a very close interaction with Nisim and his daughters, now Nisim died long ago, and his daughters and others, I have found that how Kamala Das became instrumental and started communicating poetry into different journals, magazines in India and abroad in the 60s. And she became a very prolific writer in the 70s. Now, coming directly to her, Kamala Das was one of the joints of feminine vo feminist voices in the post-colonial era. And when we talk about the feminist Indian English poetry, we start with Kamala Das. And remember, Kamala Das also wrote four words, introductions to many feminist poetess we will, we will encounter later on including Meena Kandasamy, the Tamil cyclonic poet is from Chennai. Now, she wrote in mother tongue Malayalam as well as in English. And remember, Kamala Das in her own state was known as Madhavi Kutti. And, and she is considered as the mother of modern Indian English poetry because there are father of Indian English poetry already in the name of Nisi Mazakel and uh, in the, in the 1970s, uh, Kamala Das, uh, with her prominence in Indian literary scenario, she got the tag of mother of Indian English poetry. And uh, the persons who influenced Kamala Das most, of course, there are Indian uh, factors, but remember, Sylvia Plath. And why Sylvia Plath in America? Because it was the confessional mode of writing which gave a new dimension in Sigma in late 50s and early 60s. In this connection, I should mention one book that most of the advanced students can read the book that is called Antikotha or later on it is My Story in 1973 released in Malayalam then translated into English which is also a kind of documentation of a woman growing up and becoming and establishing her name in a very patriarchal society where she is to face different kinds of stereotypes and she is to break different types of stereotypes at different levels and different times and that. Now, uh, as I have already mentioned, the confessional poetry, which is very much important in discussion with Kamala Das because which became a standard practice, stylistic practice in 19, late 1950s and 60s in the US. And why is it called confessional? Because it actually talks about life narrations and where the poets or the poets talk about the details of uh, his or her mental states, realizations, the raw truth and we poets are often uh, we we try to escape from raw truths of life almost like autobiographical and what kind of autobiographical narrations like the bio narration it has the flavor of the original original things how the mind operates in illness sexuality suicide attempts and many many other critical thoughts that go into the making of a poet. Now, 1950s, late 1950s was the time and early 60s was time of Robert Lowell, Sylvia Plath, John Berryman, and all came out with a very definite style of writing, which was later on followed by Kamala Das in Indian English poetry. And star she went with that and she attracted the critical attention of different thinking heads in a way that she thought that this is a brand new brand of trend in Indian English poetry. That's why many critics think that uh, Kamala Das in many ways is, is a trendsetter. I have a book on Kamala Das and the Kamala Das the trendsetter because I consider Kamala Das as in 1970s, the think of the time, 
when orthodoxy was there stereotypes were there we needed someone to break all stereotypes break all walls all shackles to make the society free and to uh, come out straight from the heart and straightway narratives of pain narratives of angst who is not hesitant to express our sexuality in public it is not a taboo thing at all that's why kamala das is more than her age and in 1970s she made her name and in 1980s you will all know that she was shortlisted for the nobel prize she was among the first five who were shortlisted for the nobel prize and uh, here by whisker she missed the nobel prize for literature but uh, this is not at all the one thing that we should look forward but we will have to look forward to kamala das as a cyclonic feminist poetess who inspired thousands of women writers later on in india and diasporic indians who are practicing indian english poetry as a vocation or a leisure as a, as a mode of poetry presentation now uh kamala das is is, is, is outpour is enormous the catalog is huge but for the sake of interest i have chosen only one poem with you in this morning and why is this poem because i think an introduction is not simply a poem it is an identity creation of modern individual womanhood it is it is it is a kind of journey of a modern indian womanhood looking into the poem reading the poem in close context we come to know how identity is being created identity is not a matter of what we wear or how you behave identity is how you create yourself within the stereotypes within the orthodoxical boundaries and borders and you make your own presence felt by others i always consider an introduction as an iconic indian english poem which inspires thousands and thousands of thinking heads to rethink think analyze and contextualize the poem and take inspirations from the poem why let me a close look to an introduction what is an introduction what is an introduction introduction to myself introduction to women self introduction to someone who will never submit to society introduction to an identity identity of free womanhood identity of a free speaking womanhood identity to woman who can lead into confessional mood and write the details of what she experiences it's very difficult for all of us to write out what we feel because there is always a filter between free speech level truth and the speech level truth kamala das breaks all boundaries my our tongue is candid sharp poignant and very intelligent and that's why i always consider kamala das as an intellectual soul maker intellectual soul maker now i start with one very humble submission when possibly suppose i meet someone of some of one of you in england uh i ask you the question who are you what will be your answer your answer will be i am indian isn't it your answer won't be i am ammi or i am madhavi kutti or i am kamala like that so my point is first thing the identity is the uh, taking the term from homi ke bhava narration of the nation we start the identity uh, dynamics or identity discourse with the narration of the nation with this particular sentence now let's look into first part of the poem i don't know politics but the names of those in power 
and I can repeat them like days and weeks, names of months. I am not into politics, but I am an aware self. I know what is happening. I know the names from Jawaharlal Nehru, beginning with Nehru. I am an Indian, very brown, my skin color, born in Malabar, Indian province. province. I speak three languages, the Indian linguistic formula and how Indians are codified into language discourse. We have the mother tongue, we have the father tongue, who you are the second language, and of course, the unseen presence of the national language, Hindi. I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one, and look at, this is the linguistic, sociolinguistic scenario of an Indian, of an Indian. Don't write in English, they said, English is not your mother tongue because India is India shines with vernaculars like Tamil, like Malayalam, like Bangla, like Punjabi. Our heart of India is in vernaculars. Do not leave me alone, critics, friends, visiting cousins, every one of you. Why not let me speak any language I like? I'll go on to the next part, but before that. Look into the first part. I do not know politics to this part. What is this? This is the narration of the nation. Uh, my political narration of the nation, uh, linguistic uh, uh, outpour of the nation, sociolinguistic dynamics of the nation, brown in color, Indian skin color. I'm Indian, very much Indian, born in Indian province, Malabar. So, narration of the nation is the wider perspective of an uh, of the identity of womanhood we start with look at the very peculiar and very interesting way of dealing with identity creation because very interestingly when i and you meet in uh, support support in a cafe in stockholm uh, you ask me who are you? I won't say my name is Saurabh Ganguly or something of Shatin Tendulkar. I'll say I am an Indian. So the narration of the nation is the first largest circle from where she starts visualizing, conceptualizing modern Indian womanhood in details. Now look. Language is an important part of any identity discourse. Language is political and without language, you can't contextualize someone's geography, uh, location, someone's sociolinguistic positions and someone's very much rootedness. That's why she deals with language very carefully. The language I speak becomes mine its distortions, its queerness, all mine, mine alone. Very interesting way of self-assertion in a post-colonial linguistic space. Remember, post-colonial, uh, you know, Empire Rights Back, a very important book by Bill Ashcroft et al., where there's a particular chapter on replacing language where Bill Ashcroft examines languages in different cultures and how languages in different cultures add into the discourse of post-colonial praxis. And look at Kamala Das, the language I speak becomes mine. Suppose I speak in Indian English, my English has the flavor of Indianness. You cannot brand my English as something queer, something as something out of the ordinary and something cannot brand my language as bad language, poor language. And why shall I be following the language you are using? Your British English, maybe in one form of English, by my English is contextualized in my own country. That speaks the truth of my country and something that tells the truth of life is truth itself. Therefore, very interestingly and categorically, he, she says, the language I speak becomes mine. It is in the half Indian or half English perhaps, but it is my own 
from my own production if something is my own production that is my own i give name to my daughters and my sons isn't it my son and daughters carry my my uh, surname because i produce them similar the language i produce is a stamp is stamped by my consciousness by my identity it's squareness all mine mine alone it is half english half indian funny perhaps but i celebrate it this is the uniqueness of post colonial doctrine celebration of the local i think many of you have gone through god of small things by arundhati uh, roy and possibly each page is 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 a hurdle for any learner or any reader who is not based in kerala because it is written in malayalam rhythm and lot of <clears throat> cultural mores folklores devices are there so that in order to know the complete truth of the book we will have to open up windows and doors for all cultural backgrounds in which the book is rooted or written that is very important look at what she says it is honest the language i speak is my honest language i do not wear the cloth of someone i do not write in babu english or i do not write in british english i don't have to my coat is sizened in my conditions in my uh, in my ways i have the image of the alps but i apply the image in the context of the my himalayas because himalayas is my reality alps is a foreign reality so we carry the burden of both the things we on said burden the creative resourcefulness of the alps and the himalayas together it is as human as i am human if you consider me as human my product is also human because it is human production through human machinery now she is not talking only about female discourse she is talk creating the identity of an indian here the social linguistic identity cultural identity the identity of the background in a post colonial space and she is celebrating the local in her way don't you see it voices my joys my longings my hopes and it is useful to me as carving is to crows and roaring to the lions think of the roaring of the lion it is the honest voice of a lion so if i write my english who are you to raise fingers that this is not an honest voice this is my production it has blood and flesh of myself therefore it has the it bears the stamp of my identity it is human speech the speech of the mind that is here and not there a mind that sees and hears and is aware the production i make i create is out of my awareness if i am not aware i am a stone i am because i have my awareness awareness is also an integral part of identity doctrine or identity concoction now these are all a prelude to identity creation of a modern indian uh womanhood in a way come back <coughs> to the next part of the poem where she describes her own angst pains associated to her own life as i have already seen i have already commented on that that this poem is a document of the self this poem is a self narration of the poem this poem is a confessional exercise of the poem now see i was a child later they told me i grew i was a child but i knew i was growing up but my society told me the eyes or male gaze told me that i was growing up very interesting women are not born women but they become women 
they become women by the eyes of the society very interesting discourse she adds into it now for these are the physical descriptions of growth i become tall lame swallowed one or two places sprouted here and asked for love not knowing what else to ask for he drew a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door this is the stereotype of indian family doctrine or a family domain indian social family domain is stereotype a youth of 16 into the bedroom and closed the door early marriage and it's uh, its consequences he did not beat me but my sad omen body felt so beaten the weight of my breast and omen crushed me i sprang pitifully marriage had its own downfall then i then when uh, as a woman you think that life is not within you and not in your hands you start taking the other side of the coin i wore a shirt and my brother's trousers as i thought power belongs to the other part of the sex male people or males use the power because they are in the center and we are in the periphery therefore i i wore a shirt and my brother's trousers cut my hair short and ignored my womanliness as if i am taking a pretending game and enjoy i want to enjoy the status of being in the center by being a biological other <clears throat> then there is society society says dress in sarees are shari poro be girl be wife karun there are three roles that women play girl where you have father wife you have husband and mother you have the sun as your pole stars that's why it's an important criticism to role relationship in society sociological role relationship in society dress in sarees if you dress in sarees i can exploit you my machinery can exploit you because sari in some times pre uh, prevents you to jump prevents you to your your mobility as sari stands for that denies mobility in some sort of form next comes a very important phrase for indian society fit in whatever may happen fit in into that so this is a kind of suggestion comes from the social categorizers fit in into whatever you are oh belong be part of someone so you should be known by someone's name belong cried the categorizers cried the categorizers as if nothing can happen if you don't belong to someone because you will have to first be a part of someone and then you will have to put your identity as if you are a parrot of others man's living of course by other here means males are living and don't sit on the walls or peep in through our less trapped windows sitting wall is a symbol beyond the world you have the world so if you see the world you will love crossing the wall wall is limitations stereotypes created by male for female very important uh, divisions wall inside the wall and outside the wall if you are on the wall you can see both sides of the world so this wall breaking or peep through in last trap windows are symbols for looking into the world you cannot look into the home and the world be ammi be kamala or better still be madhavi kutti be sita be shabitri so that the patriarchal machinery can exploit you like anything you take an idolatry name that's why oh sita is like that shabitri is like that a predictable expectations are like that perform like sita perform like shabitri perform like ammi like kamala or madhavi kutti take an idolatry name don't go out of the box it is time to choose a name a role that is the predicament on a patriarchal society 
for any woman there is a role in three role relationships father's daughter then husband wife and then mother and his son so take one role and stick to that don't play pretending games don't play at schizophrenia or be an impo don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love love can come love can go man can come man can go but don't cry for that don't be jilted for love don't cry embarrassingly loud when jilted in love actually love is not in your hand so people can come and give you love as like begging and we do have no right for that and don't scream for love again she is reminiscing our own past i i i met a man loved him call him not by any name he is every man who wants a woman very a different perspective of female gaze into man as man wants any woman just as i am every woman who seeks love look at the contrast as a woman i want love as man man wanted any woman woman body not love for man love is not important the discourse of a body is more prominent in him the hungry hest of rivers i have seen he is wild and for wilderness it's not permanent it comes and goes it's transitory but for me ocean style is waiting for me i wait 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 for waiting that is waiting personified look at the binary divisions of male gauge women gauge and coming uh, into in one direction and on one point of time she is pretending herself as male as well as woman and presenting both the gauges together and what a wonderful way of presentation and look at her language as well the answer is it is anywhere and everywhere i see the one who calls himself in the world is tightly packed like the sword in the skin it is i who drink lonely drinks at 12 midnight in hotels of strange towns wonderful presentation of human psyche when someone is terribly alone in an unknown strange town where there is no one known to him or oh, sorry her she drinks a lonely drink at midnight because no one to share her pains with her because if she wants to share with someone she is, or he or he is a product of patriarchy he is a product of male gauge that's why she can't share her thoughts with anyone and she takes lonely drinks at midnight 12 o'clock in a strange town but everybody is strange everything is strange every hotel is strange it is i who love it is i who make love then feel shame all experiences are judged rejudged countered recounted again in myself it is i who will i die with a rattle in my throat i can't express what has gone into me what has crushed me what life has given to me it is i who lie dying a rattle in my throat i am sinner i am sin if i have done something for myself i have done it and if something is great been achieved by myself it is i and look at the repetition of the word i we started with neutral narration of the nation now we are in the last four five lines excessive word use of the word i this iness is the ultimate of man create or woman creating his or her own space but contextually to this particular poem it is the womanhood it is the righteous womanhood it is the voice within to rediscover reaffirm faith in woman by herself therefore excessive use of the term pronoun i i i i from the neutral descriptions 
of the country with three languages, born in Malabar, recounting the tales of from uh, or see, sorry, since uh, Nehru. Again, I come back. I am sinner. I am saint. I am the beloved and the betrayed. It's all my journey, my course of life towards my integrated self. I have no joys that are not yours. Predicament of woman takes all joys of her role relationships in our role relationships. No aches, pains which are not yours. That means I have taken all pains that you have. I have shared everything that you have. Your joys are my joys. Your pains are my pains. I take them all like nil contour. I grab them all. I construct, reconstruct my own identity. And look at the last sentence. Repetition of the word pronoun I. I too call myself I. And the poem ends with affirmative I. And the poem has a journey from neutral perspectives to I. As if it is the discovery of the self. It is the narration of the self. It is the retelling of the self. Recapitulation of the self. Through this journey, the modern womanhood achieves her power, achieves her grace, achieves her dignity. So that's why this poem is read as a dignity discourse, as also a discourse of identification, discourse of cultural uh, patronage, a cultural challenge. Because within the gamut of Indian society and culture, women feel uprooted. So this poem is coming back to mother, coming back to the resources, coming back to what makes her woman. I, 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 to call myself I. Whatever is disjointed, now restored, because I have found nothing else matters, but my dignity matters, my identity matters in the world of binary discourses and gauges. I, the poem ends with I. That means it is a narration towards her own life, towards her own identity and ultimate. That's why Kamala Das is an introduction, is an introduction and prelude to the self, to the self for which life burns, for the self for a woman who burns and makes the world so beautiful. I have my perspective to live the world in my dignity, in my dignified way. Nobody is there to, uh, to give me protection or to give me any right unless I claim that for myself. I have the power to see future. I have the power to see present and judge my own judgments. Whatever is done, I have done. Whatever is accepted, accepted by myself. The rural and urban discourses come and go. But wherever I may be placed, but I carry my own identity. I carry my own I. Always in midnight or in the early part of the day, in a strange city or a city like Kolkata or a town, provincial town like Malabar, I may be born with a brown color, but the color is determined by my identity. I, 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 a dignity discourse. Thank you. And I expect uh, three, two, three questions to take. I know so many things to tell, but the time is limited. I enjoy talking to you. And now the class is open for discussion. Over to the head. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your um, insightful lecture on Kamala Das, something that we were really uh, waiting for such a long time, our students and uh, the faculty members as well. Um, 
so when we think of kamala das personally speaking the first thing that came to my mind was uh, this poem that we all read in our school days a hot noon in malabar where uh, despite you know all those vivid images of uh, heat and dust uh, she is basically giving us a very refreshing picture and uh, then of course uh, an introduction and my story followed in the undergraduate and graduation days so uh, kamala das is very close to our hearts the teachers as well as the students and um, i think your talk uh, made it all the more wonderful to connect with it um so we'll be taking a few questions but uh, before that i just want to quickly summarize uh, uh, whatever you have said in today's lecture uh, so you basically started with uh, why is kamala das so important uh, in the current scenario about her childhood about her days spent in calcutta her upbringing literary career and so on uh then you talked about uh, the promotion of vernacular literature as well as indian writing in english uh, which kind of uh, came together at this particular point of time the birth of indian english poetry and the contribution of uh, several great poets and authors uh you spoke about the confessional mode of poetry um which was primarily influenced by sylvia plath and uh, and sexton and uh, other writers who were trying to uh, talk about their uh, repressed sexuality the taboos and traumas which they have been facing in their lives something which they could not discuss in the open so that is something which we also find in the writings of kamala das and uh, then you started with the significance of the title and introduction and uh, how indians are codified into language the post colonial position of kamala das uh, the creative resourcefulness of both the east and the west where uh, she is trying to kind of uh, combine the thoughts and ideas of her own motherland as well as uh, the uh, west so uh, this is more or less and obviously there was a beautiful explanation of the poem and introduction um and uh, we would be going into the questions but before that uh, if i may just i wanted to ask you um do you think uh, in one of the interviews that i was reading kamala das says that uh, she is not very fond of the feminism uh, that uh, the western uh, countries kind of promote the western feminists and she says that uh, the western feminists they are out and out lesbian that is not the kind of feminism that i look for and uh, so don't you think that's a very uh, a kind of problematic statement to make and also what do you think is her position of feminism if she's not really catering to the western feminism then what is her form of feminism absolutely and uh, feminism is an ivory term in some way it's a it's a mm -hmm. it's a movement determined by middle class upper middle class movement it never penetrated into the discourse of the down trodden Pen right. uh, feminism did not penetrate into the labor movement Pen uh, uh, feminism was silent to the aboriginal women feminism is silent to maori women the tribal women their sub uh, their contexts are so different it's a movement of middle class upper middle class it had its own limitation because of Uh, another thing i didn't tell you that is very important look at the western literature that we all studies british literature we studied the author we also studied the scholarship on the author think of we had shakespeare we also had shakespearean criticism we had india uh, british writing and we have also criticism paper so a writer lives with criticism but indian writings demand indian english criticism which was absent in indian universities you read kamala das but you are reading feminist discourse of the west why not shurmila rege why not uma chakravarti kamala das can never be interpreted by a foreign critic who has defined her codes and his codes of feminism from the western perspectives Sharmila Rege, Uma Chakravarti can only determine the Indian context of feminism, and uh, uh, think of Bama or Kullani Thakur Chadal, Dalit feminism. Dalit feminists, where where no Western feminist model can be applied to Dalit feminism. Think of the feminism of the Northeast India. How uh, if no feminist discourse of the West can give you? the wholesome picture of the feminist modalities in the northeast india therefore 
feminism is uh, feminism will have to look into different cultural backgrounds with the criticism developed around it that is my humble right. submission so when i am yeah. reading bama's karukku i will be uh, uh, i will be using the western text but i will be mainly following the indian gharana of feminism which will be my easy accessible tools to unburden my scholarship on bama which is, who is a product of indian society so mm -hmm. this is one loop we fall in the trap but indian english uh, you know criticism is developing like anything i think it's a bright side of last 50 years or so we have enough critics in different fields of indian writing in english and indian english writing indian english writings can only be properly understood by critics of indian writing in english like of course harish trivedi minakshi mukherjee and uh, alur jankiram uh, ayangar srinivas ayangar many others to tell because we have three four generations of english on our back we are not mm -hmm. only following one generation of english so we have the arms and ammunitions well brushed and it is not that we will fall in the trap of the west they actually made society for us to interpret things and for future so i am fully agree with you fully agree with kamala das who was not happy with feminism of the western model because indian society is different indian sociology is different indian readers are different that's why indian feminism has to be different uh, it is no west can determine what is to come in india sure yes right so i think that is the reason i think what she is trying to say is more than this umbrella term feminism we should go for feminisms because there are so many schools yeah. of feminism in the western and the eastern countries each with their own ideology so mm -hmm. it's up to the choice of the individual which want to go for Um, okay, so I would now go with the questions from the students. We don't have too many questions, though. The first one comes from Jayashree Sardar, and she says, "What is the predominant thematic concerns of Kamala Das as a poet? What is I the have, predominant I have, thematic?" Uh, I, I have already spoken about the narration of the self, narration of the self in the context of uh, the identity creation, and say identity creation. a uh, dignity discourse another uh, is a dignity her, all her works are dignity discourse towards a dignified mm -hmm. womanhood uh feminism uh, uh in a different perspective is also an important issue another important issue is you uh, know of course uh, how uh, the life is been witnessed by kamala das indian society the structures of indian society a uh, stratifications of indian society uh and the patriarchy and its loopholes and uh, it's all her poems are poems of resistance and a poems of resistance i will say and i also always read kamala das as a, a, as a post colonial poetess you know and uh, she talks about the context of post colonial praxis different parameters and different positions coming from a different background that is very important another thing is experimentation with language a language yes. is so bold and so different and she talks about uh, the identity creation through language that is very very unique you know uh, according to minakshi mukherjee has a very famous essay the anxiety of indianness so she doesn't suffer from anxiety of indianness kamala das is free from the anxiety of indianness but she is very proud of being an indian celebration of indianness is her forte i'll say the stronghold right thank you sir uh, the next question comes from ipshita bej and she says uh, she quotes this lines from the poem i'm sinner i'm saint i am the beloved and the betrayed and she has asked if you could just explain the phrase absolutely absolutely it comes from the universities for pg and ug for explanations because i create my own standard i create my who am i and you know seen and saint these are the terms society imposes on us so it is seen it is not seen who who are you to tell me what is seen what is not seen i will judge my scenes and not scenes 
so i won't be judgmental and i will not let myself be judged by society social categorizers so my character is my my own build up character so i am the beloved and the betrayed if i have done anything i am responsible if i have done something miraculous it is my responsibility so always i i celebrate what i am so i am happy if i am um, i am the beloved i am unhappy because i am betrayed i i don't subscribe to what uh, others give me any tag like that i am a saint i am a sinner i am a beloved i am a betrayed who am i i am happy with that okay uh, the next question is from sweety parui and uh, she says that uh, this very famous line that we all are acquainted with where kamalada says i speak in three languages write in two and dream in one so that one question which always comes to her mind that what language she actually dreams in i mean uh, we understand that she speaks three languages what are those languages and the two languages in which she writes which is which are probably malayalam and english but what is the language do you think she dreams in <laughs> you know of course uh, malayalam english and of course uh, she was also familiar with bengali language remember yes. she spent a lot of time in calcutta summer in calcutta is one of her favorite books and of course possibly bangla and this is uh, the socio linguistic picture of india i think she wa- didn't want to make any uh, comment about herself here she wanted to express uh, the indian socio linguistic predicaments only okay that is right yeah uh, if i could just add in this context i was reading yeah. an uh, interview of kamala das which is called on masks and memories and uh, this interviewer asked this very important question that uh, ma'am in which language do you dream in and the interviewer uh, kind of takes it for granted that she dreams in malayali because it's a given that we always tend to dream in our mother tongue but then she says that uh, i dream in english i am afraid so i think all this language shaming that we uh, go through every day just because you're a bengali you have to you know uh, confine yourself to the language and you can cannot go beyond that to write in english or dream in english that i think is challenged uh, by kamala das when she says that in the interview that she dares to dream in uh, english and not in malayali per se but i think when it comes to the poem it's open to interpretation because uh, if we have not read that interview then of course we can bring in our own interpretation absolutely absolutely yes. as that i was telling you that you know uh, most of us who have uh, three four generations of english on our back so english has been new- neutralized and naturalized in our discourse so we can yes. dream in english also we can dream yeah, in that's english. what is the okay. fluidity of language uh, all about absolutely, i mean absolutely absolutely yeah. Yeah. uh okay next question is from uh, shohina khatun who says does the poem an introduction an exclusively personal experience or is it faintly fairly universal you know this is of course uh, unique experience is uh, part of this uh, poem and it has three parts of the poem as we have identified and it starts with the narration of the nation so she is talking in general the ideal position of indian womanhood in particular and then she goes into personal story in order right. to support her general uh, uh, statement of indian women's predicament i think hmm 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 yeah and we have just one more question the last one which comes from ipshita mitro and she says that um, when kamala das says in an introduction that she is uh, wearing her brother's clothes and cropping her hair short uh, can we say that she is embracing some sort of androgyny because you know all these uh, combination of the masculine and the feminine values that uh, she is trying to adopt absolutely absolutely possibly she is thinking that other side is enjoying the power discourse more advantage is position so maybe uh, maybe uh, a kind of psychology our psychology is very very uh, you know fuzzy thing we don't predict what uh, our psychology says possibly she was possibly she was thinking that the other side is enjoying power so let me pre- uh, take a pretending game and wearing shirt and uh, cutting the hair short so that i will enjoy uh, ignore my womanliness quote and quote ignore my womanliness and become a uh, part of the center of the power this is how our yes. mind operates maybe 
maybe or at the same thing it's a kind of satire on male part as well maybe yes so so that ignoring the womanliness is perhaps again a bit problematic because this is the age old debate between the liberals and the radicals where one group says you have to be like men to get the equality absolutely. and the other absolutely. says that you can stay feminine and yet you should be given the right absolutely absolutely um, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> okay thank you sir uh, once again for being with us despite your busy schedule and uh, you know sharing all your thoughts and ideas and i really wish we could hear more uh, uh, from you about her uh, you know repress sexuality and all those angles but then we have a very limited time span and we understand that uh, we can't cover everything um, i would uh, ask uh, my dear colleague atriparna Ch uh, chattopadhyay to uh, kindly present the vote of thanks thank you so much thank you for inviting me yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Honorable Shashank Ma'am. At the end of such an insightful lecture, followed by an engaging question-answer session, I'm supposed to deliver the word of thanks. This is the very first lecture on Indian English literature in the whole web lecture series, and all of us have really enjoyed the talk today. We are really grateful uh, to our honourable speaker, Dr. Uh, Jaydeep Shankar Sir. Uh, the principal of New Manipur College for managing time for, for us from his extremely busy schedule and uh, from the huge response of our students, we can assume that his lecture has truly inspired our students. Uh, I would like to extend my vote of thanks to our chief patron, Dr. Devashish Pal, the principal of our institution, for continuously inspiring us in all our creative ventures. I also thank Mr. Shandir Kumar Dului, the head of the Department of English at Uberia College, uh, for always uh, being there whenever uh, the benefit of our students is concerned. I would also like to thank all my colleagues whose immense effort in organizing this web lecture series have made it a huge success. At last but not the least, I would like to thank all our students and all the participants who have attended this lecture and have shown immense enthusiasm and spontaneity in following the lecture and asking uh, brilliant questions throughout the session. So that's all for today. We are about to end the session here. Thank you, Dr. Sarangi, and thank you all once again. Thank you, Ulberia College, Department of English, and uh, I wish you good luck. Thank you, students. I hope this talk will be a catalyst for more talks in future on Indian English poetry. Yes, Next sir. Question and we expect that uh, someday after the, this pandemic situation ends, you will come to our college to deliver a lecture and uh, we can meet you physically there. Okay, take care. So it and all my pleasure for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, sir.